never played football. I played hockey, but I didn't play Because you have such broad shoulders. Oh, do I? <laughs> well, yeah. Now I played hockey once, oh. so uh, I'm going to start anyway, uh, and other people come in. Um, I'll introduce myself again. My name is Evan Weiner. I've been here before. We're going to be talking about the calendar year 1971, and with all the news with the United States and China and tariffs, 1971 is a good place to start. Uh, I've been uh, doing this for a very long time. I've been speaking before groups for 25 years, and I've been in the media since 1971. Some of you might know that I worked uh, with WNEW AM radio in the late 1970s. Uh, my big break was interviewing John Lindsay, who was the former New York City mayor who uh, decided to tell me he was going to run for governor of the state of New York. And uh, all of a sudden, I was on WNEW AM radio, which was a good radio station back in the day and doesn't exist anymore. Anyway, the calendar year 1971, and it's in 1971 that ping pong of all things, a ping pong tournament opens up the relationship between the United States and, well, at that point, Communist China or Red China. Believe it or not, it was a ping pong tournament that took place in Japan. Ping pong is one of the things that went on. Another thing, a war between Pakistan and India. And um, you might recognize that picture. That's Gloria, that's Edith, Meathead, and Archie Bunker. All in the Family started in 1971. And the show All in the Family, probably as it was constituted in 1971, 48 and a half years ago, probably would never get on the air today as was. Uh, there's also the war in Vietnam that's continuing. And there's John Kerry, who ran for president in 2004. John Kerry testified before a congressional committee that it was a waste of time and human lives to be in Vietnam in 1971. And I don't know how many of you have been to this place, supposedly the happiest place on earth. That is the Magic Kingdom at Disney World, down in Orlando, Florida, or Bona Vista, Florida. Disney World opened in 1971. A lot of the elements from Disney World came from the New York City World's Fair. <coughs> Were you at the World's Fair in New York City back in 64, 65? <coughs> Any of you? Well, Walt Disney used the 1964, 65 World's Fair as sort of an incubator for what he was planning in Florida, which eventually became uh, Walt Disney World. And also, the astronaut, Alan Shepard. Alan Shepard actually hit a golf ball on the moon. It was Apollo 14 in early 1971. The Apollo moon landing series is winding down at this point with Apollo 14. There would only be three more, three more lunar flights after this one. And also, you all have a computer today. This is one of the earliest computers that was on the market in 1971. Let's talk about China and the United States. Right now we're in the tariff war with China. Right now we're imposing all kinds of tariffs on China and China is retaliating. This would not be possible prior to 1972. In 1971, a thing as obscure as a ping pong tournament ended up changing the history of the world. Between 1949 and 1971, the People's Republic of China and the United States didn't talk to one another. It wasn't quite the Cold War that was taking place between the Soviet Union and the United States, although, as we called it in those days, Communist China, Red China, was certainly an ally of the Soviet Union. Uh, there had been trade embargoes and diplomatic silence between 1949 and 1971. There had been no official American delegation inside of Red China or the People's Republic of China in more than 20 years at that point. China had an alliance with the Soviet Union, but in 1969, that thing went south. Uh, in March of 1969, it was a, a border skirmish. Uh, and there would be another one, March 14th. There would be casualties 
Soviets even thought of nuking, nuking Red China at that point. Bloody clashes. It was all done by September of 1969 when uh, the Soviet Premier Kosygin met with his Chinese counterpart Chou Enlai. But there was an uneasy truce between the two sides, and Mao Zedong is looking for an opening, maybe that he could get away from the uh, Soviet Union at that point. There is Chairman Mao. Chairman Mao may be looking toward the United States by 1971 to form some sort of strategic alliance. Mao believed that uh, Americans, if there were ties with Americans, might serve as a deterrent against the Soviet Union or Russia. Meanwhile, remember Richard Nixon? Richard Nixon was the president. Richard Nixon made the opening of China a top priority of his administration. But since there were no official channels and they weren't talking to one another, something dramatic had to happen for the United States and for China to start talking to one another. Here's Richard Nixon. Nixon pointing at somebody. Maybe he was pointing at the United States ping pong or table tennis team because it was table tennis that opened it up. During the 1971 World Table Hi. Hi. During the World Table Tennis Championships in Nagoya, Japan, a 19-year-old player by the name of Glenn Cowan hopped onto the Chinese team's bus and started a conversation with people on the Chinese team bus, except nobody was talking to him. Cowan was 19 years old. He was from California, but he had some roots in New Rochelle in Westchester County, New York. Um, he was a top-ranked United States table tennis player. He was kind of a hippie, even though hippies didn't exist since 1967. And he figured, well, why not? Why don't I jump on the bus and see if I can make friends with these people? And there he is, making friends with these people, including the top table tennis player in China at the time. It's kind of odd that table tennis would even be considered Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong, banned table tennis back in the mid-1960s during his Cultural Revolution. So it's kind of odd that all of a sudden a team made up of China's China ping pong players would hook up with American ping pong players and all of a sudden there would be ping pong diplomacy. Zad Zedong uh, was the team's greatest player. He stepped forward on the bus. He shook Cowan's hand and spoke to him through an interpreter. All of a sudden, photographers caught the incident, or the handshake, on film. The Chinese players arrived at the Japan Championships in 1971 with strict orders, do not go, any, do not go near any Americans. But, but, Chairman Mao was happy with this little exchange. And he talked about how Zidon was not just a good table tennis player, but he's a good diplomat as well. He handed Cowan a gift. And all of a sudden, the doors opened between the United States and China. Forty-eight years later, Chinese and the Americans trade all sorts of goods, sell all sorts of goods. And we have this tariff war that's going on right now between the two countries. According to Sidon, uh, uh, we got nervous. Nobody talked to him. We were under strict orders to avoid fraternizing with the political enemy. Cowan was on the bus for about 10 minutes. Nobody came to talk to him. None of the tennis players from the United States was particularly proficient at playing ping pong. Uh, the team was ranked as the 24th best team in the world. And most of the players were amateurs who had to uh, beg or mar borrow or maybe even steal money to make it to the championships in Japan. Nobody gave them money. There were no sponsors. They had to do it all by themselves. Uh, they arrived a few days uh, after the tournament starts. And inadvertently, they became America's top diplomats in 1971. And there they are. All of a sudden, Mao Zedong paid for all expense paid trip to China for these ping pong players. And Richard Nixon 
and the United States and the White House started to think, hey, wait a minute, we might have that opening that we're all looking for to get relationships and the relations with China. U.S. team was prepared to leave Magoya when Mao Zedong himself decided he's going to shock the world. And he gave them an all-expense paid trip to China. After checking with the American embassy, the American players jumped on it. They were going to go to China, and Mao Zedong had scored a major international victory. And there they are again, Great Wall of China, a rag bag a ragtag bunch of table tennis players all of a sudden in China. He spent 10 days there. One of the players, Tim Boggan, he said everything was different from anything I'd ever seen. The streets were different. The food was different. The people, of course, were different. The bicycles were different. All of a sudden, the Chinese became friends with the United States. Here's Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger goes to Peking, in those days called Peking, to meet with Chou Enlai. All of a sudden, there had been some, some back-channel communication between the two countries, but all of a sudden, the United States and China made nice to one another. Nixon had sent Henry Kissinger, who's the Secretary of State, secretly to Peking, to arrange a presidential visit. Nixon's journey was seven months later, in February 1972. And Nixon had a grand old time going through China, and all of a sudden, China was open. It took 48 years, or it took 22 years at that point. It's taken 48 years since then to get all these tariffs and into this economic war with China. Time Magazine, they had the ping pong team on the cover. The ping pong team. A bunch of nobodies, all of a sudden becoming somebodies. Great Wall of China. Chiang Mai said, never before in history has this sport been used so effectively as a tool of international democracy diplomacy. For Nixon, well, it was the week that changed the world. And he probably was right. The United States was in the Cold War with the Soviet Union at that time. The United States was still immersed in a very unpopular war in Vietnam at that time. And Nixon was beginning to really suffer from paranoia. I'll tell you about that in a minute, because the first of the break-ins that would ultimately nail him took place in 1971 at uh, Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's place. And there they are. In 1972, oh, why is that man smiling? Richard Nixon. Well, Mao Zedong won't have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. Mao Zedong and Richard Nixon. The handshake, and all of a sudden, it's a different world. Nixon noted that the Chinese leaders took particular delight in reminding me that in the exchange of ping pong tennis teams had initiated a great breakthrough in our relations. They seemed to enjoy the method used to achieve the result as much as the result itself. Perhaps the most fitting table tennis metaphor came courtesy of Mao Zedong himself. The little ball moves the big ball. And all of a sudden, the United States and China go into business together and would continue in business together. Although that didn't help the end of the Vietnam War, Although there were still problems with Taiwan, problems that exist with Taiwan through today. Um, if you remember, Chiang Kai-shek was kicked out of China by Mao Zedong and his people and fled to Taiwan. Taiwan is a separate entity from the rest of China, but China thinks that Taiwan is one of its provinces, and that has not been cleared all these years later. There's Glenn Cowan. Glenn Cowan was 19 years old at the time. He was a self-described hippie, and he's on top of the world. He is literally on top of the world. He's the guy who we think, we think, made this all happen. But let's think again, because maybe there's a part of the story that's missing. Meanwhile, Cowan said, 
I think I could mediate between Joe and Lyon Nixon quite easily. But what Callan couldn't do was handle his sudden fame. A book, TV pilot, all flamed out. He started taking drugs. Depression flared up, and he was never the same after that. And there is the ping pong team playing the United States ping pong team. Now, during the Cultural Revolution, remember the Cultural Revolution in China, in Little Mao's, uh, or Mao's Little Red Book, uh, it started in 1966, this revolution. And Mao Zedong decided to purge China of any taint of capitalism. He denounced as having put too much emphasis on winning with the table tennis team, and all of a sudden the table tennis team disappeared from view. It was gone. It was totally gone. Another picture of uh, Zitang. Table tennis was banned during the Cultural Revolution. Several top players killed themselves. They had nothing to live for. Zidane surfaced in 1971 for an exhibition match and then led the team to the World Championships in Japan. There's Mao Zedong, a young Mao Zedong with Madame Mao. Jiang Qin married Mao in November 1938. She was the first lady of the People's Republic of China. She's best known for playing a major role in the Cultural Revolution and for forming what would become the radical political gang alliance of the Gang of Four. The Gang of Four maintained power uh, through the control of media, propaganda, and doing everything that Mao Zedong wanted. But when Mao died, the Gang of Four lost their power, and they were imprisoned and later tried, 1980 and 81, for their activities during the Cultural Revolution which had been 15 years earlier. Meanwhile, here's Zidane. He became a favorite of Mao's wife. Big favorite of Mao's wife. There was a rumor that they were having an affair together. He denied it, saying that uh, it was a motherly relationship, that uh, Madame Mao just looked after him as a mother would. He became the sports minister and a member of the Central Committee in 1975. But after when Mao died in 1976, the Gang of Four fell from power, so did uh, Zidane, uh, who found himself under house arrest for two and a half years. Then he spent the next five years in internal exile before returning to Beijing. Uh, there's Cowan. Cowan having a good old time in uh, Manhattan, top of the world, and he falls from top of the world real fast. Callan dies in 2004. A friend of his said, after China, everything seemed to be useless. He was inducted into the California Table Tennis Hall of Fame in 2014, but he peaked at the age of 19, never really to be heard from again. Zidane, with his friend, uh, or looking back at uh, his uh, days uh, when he opened up China for the United States, uh, after Cowan died, he said uh, he wished to express his sympathy. 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 He's sorry. And in 2007, he did go to the United States. He met Cowan's mother. But his great, biggest regret in life was never seeing Cowan again after those days in the 1970s. That's Rosemary Woods. Remember Rosemary Woods? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Remember, there was missing uh, audio from one of the tapes, and she said, well, it's just the Rosemary Wood stretch. She had been uh, Richard Nixon's long-term personal secretary, and, well, we'll get into that stretch in 1973 or 1974, but apparently she forgot to turn off a tape or hit a tape, and there's an 18-minute or so gap in the tapes that would ultimately nail Richard Nixon with Watergate. Uh -huh. On February 14, 1971, uh, yes, Richard Nixon installs secret taping device in the White House. All of a sudden, Richard Nixon decides, well, you know what, I'm going to tape all my conversations. Big mistake, as it turns out, because it was some of those conversations that would ultimately ultimately lead to the demise of Richard Nixon's presidency in 1974. That's Robert McNamara.
not one of the favorite people of people who came of age in 1965, 66, 67, 68. Secretary of Defense, former oil maker executive, knew a lot about numbers, apparently didn't have too many good people skills, certainly should never have been the Secretary of Defense. He had no business there. He had no background. He was a number pusher for the auto industry. But Robert McNamara becomes a central character in 1971. Remember the Pentagon Papers? Remember the Pentagon Papers? Well, it was something called the Pentagon Papers that McNamara commissioned a report. Well, actually, after McNamara was gone. A report on political and military involvement of the United States in Vietnam. The report covers the United States' involvement in Southeast Asia from World War II to 1968. Commissioned by McNamara in 1967, Secretary of Defense. The Vietnam War is continuing, as you can see. It's 1971, seven years since the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. No end in sight. Absolutely no end in sight for the Vietnam War. Any of you protesters, peace protesters, or pro-war during the Vietnam days, you ever go out and protest? No. No? Anybody? We have no protests. Well, Mike's not here. No, who was that? <laughs> who was the wonder? Wonder that uh, what? protested. What, what are you who, talking about? Who was the wonder that? Well, Muhammad Ali was was a Pardon? major protester. The what? Muhammad Ali. No, there was a woman there too. Oh, there were like Jane Fonda. Who's yeah, the one? James. Fonda. But she's in 1972. She sat on the tank in 1972 in Hanoi, but that's 1972. Got to come back to the next one to hear about that. <laughs> Jane Fonda. And there's Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg was the guy who leaked the Pentagon Papers. He had it, and he decided he was going to tell the world about the United States military activity, particularly in Vietnam. He was a government consultant. He gained access to some of the classified documents, leaked them to the New York Times in June of 1971. The reports revealed many large-scale attacks that the United States public was not aware of. The general feeling was, at least in Ellsberg's mind, that the United States government had misled the public and withheld the truth about Vietnam. I don't know how many of you bought the Pentagon Papers. They were in paperback in 1972. They were available, the New York Times Pentagon Papers. The New York Times initially could not, could not print it. They were slapped with an injunction order, stop the publication. So Ellsberg gets around that, and he provides the Pentagon Papers to the Washington Post and 15 other newspapers. The case entitled Times against the United States ultimately went to the Supreme Court, which ruled on June 30th, 1971, 6-3 decision. The newspapers could print the Pentagon Papers and not worry about government censorship. For linking the papers, Ellsberg was charged with theft, conspiracy, and violation of the Espionage Act. So Richard Nixon has a problem here, but he doesn't solve the problem. E. Howard Hunt does, and he drafts a proposal to neutralize Ellsberg, leading to an operation to attack Ellsberg's psychiatrist and break into Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. So already Nixon has installed the taping system and one of his surrogates has decided, you know what, why don't we break into his psychiatrist's office to see what we could dig up to discredit Daniel Ellsberg. The plumbers first tasked the burglary of Daniel Ellsberg's Los Angeles psychiatrist's office, Louis J. Fieldway. What they wanted to do was uncover evidence to discredit Ellsberg, who had leaked the Pentagon Papers. September 3rd, 1971, E. Howard Hunt, who had been with the CIA, broke into the office, crowbarred open the drawers of a file to get the evidence that they were looking for. The White House plumbers, the White House plumbers 
given the name plumbers because they were formed to plug leaks or create leaks. We're after the file, hoping to get any information they could use against Daniel Ellsberg. The break-in uh, was only revealed nine months afterwards, during a recess in the trial. Uh, the White House wanted to keep Ellsberg off of the stand. He was facing charges in Out of the News during the 1972 political re-election cycle. They figured that if we could somehow hide Ellsberg, we don't have to worry about 1972. For some reason, Nixon was very paranoid about 1972. Well, there were a couple reasons for that. One was the economy was a mess. Two, Nixon was still mired in Vietnam. Three, he had no idea who the Democratic nominee would be, but he assumed it would be Edmund Muskie of Maine, and he was going to go after Muskie. So those might have been some of the reasons why Nixon was paranoid. Now, who were the White House plumbers? Howard Hunt. G. Gordon Liddy, who after doing jail time, ended up in my business as a talk show host. James McCord, Chuck Colson. The White House created a unit to ensure internal security. The unit was called the Plumbers because they stopped leaks. In 1971, they burglarized the office of Daniel Ellsberg, psychiatrist, looking for material to discredit him. First time I found out about the break in, Ellsberg said, one, the government prosecutors revealed it to the judge and he told my lawyers. Nixon had wanted that information withheld. He had been warned that this could make him criminally liable. The judge cited government misconduct and dismissed all charges. But that wouldn't deter the plumbers. The plumbers would be busy in 1972. And there is Richard Nixon with the Attorney General at the time, John Mitchell. The irony, that was John Ehrlichman, I'm sorry. The irony from Ellsberg. Had my lawyers and I known about the break-in from the beginning, Ehrlichman would have had to shut the illegal plumber's operation down. And the Watergate, June 1972 break-in, might never have taken place. So because the plumbers were so inept at what they were doing, eventually, eventually they would take down Nixon because of ineptitude. Daniel Shore, who was on Nixon's enemy list, was one of the first people to break the story about the plumbers. Nixon's enemy list came out in 1971. Tommy Smothers had assumed he was on Nixon's enemy list. He thought he was. Nixon got rid of him, or tried to get rid of him and Dickie Smothers and the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour in 1969. But Nixon's uh, list came out September 9, 1971. Whole bunch of names on that list. It's compiled by Charles Colson, written by George T. Bell. It was sent to John Dean, who is still around today, on September 9, 1971. The list was part of a campaign officially known as Opponents List, Political Enemies Project. Do you want to guess who might have been on that list? Do you have any guesses? Because some of the names on that list would probably surprise you. Like him. Who's that? Paul Newman. Paul Newman. Paul Newman is on Nixon's enemy list. He's an actor. Drove race cars. Became an entrepreneur up here in Connecticut, selling all kind of stuff to put on your salad. Paul Newman was on Nixon's enemy list. The people who were on, who were on Nixon's enemy list, described by a White House counsel office, people who screwed Nixon, they were going to screw them back. Tax audits by the IRS, manipulating grant availability, federal contracts, uh, litigation, prosecution. The IRS Commissioner Don C. Alexander refused, refused to launch audits of the people on the list. Supposedly Dick Cavett was on the list. Dick Cavett went on the air saying he knew he was on the list because he and every one of his staff all of a sudden was audited by the IRS. I guess Richard Nixon didn't like Dick Cavett. Paul Newman, think of Paul Newman on that list. There's John Dean, John Dean who testified during the Watergate hearings. 
the general counsel of the White House, and you see him on TV today talking about what's going on with the White House. John Dean, a loyal soldier. The list becomes public on June 27, 1973, during the Watergate hearings. Daniel Shore happened to be on that list. He obtained a copy of the list and reported it later that day on CBS. Now, 2008, remember, remember Richard Nixon? Remember, oh, I taped all these conversations. Nixon is uh, taped, and there's a transcript available in 2008 about what he thought of things. He talked about, oh, the press is the enemy. The establishment's the enemy. The professors are the enemy. Everybody seemed to be Richard Nixon's enemy by 1971. Meanwhile, the Vietnam War goes on and on and on with no end in sight, although the United States had begun taking men out of Vietnam and had reduced the number of troops in Vietnam. On, September, on December 31st, 1970, there were 334,600 troops in South Vietnam. On January 6th, the United States Secretary of State Melvin Laird said, of the Vietnamization it was running ahead of time, and that uh, combat missions of the United States troops would end in the summer of 1971. January 6, Congress adopted a revised Cooper Church Amendment which prohibited the introduction of U.S. ground troops or advisors into Cambodia and declared the U.S. aid to Cambodia should not be considered a commitment to the defense of Cambodia. That is the Reverend Berrigan, Philip Berrigan, January 12th. 12 U.S. federal grand juries on the 12th indict Reverend Philip Berrigan and others, including a nun and two priests, on charges of plotting to kidnap Henry Kissinger. Berrigan attracted the notice of federal authorities again when he and six other activists uh, were caught trading letters alluding to the kidnapping of Henry Kissinger and bombing. Uh, steam tunnels. They were charged with 23 counts of conspiracy, including plans for kidnapping and blowing up heat.